Today we're talking about ladies and children doing your verse, but a home improvement is what we've been centering on. As you're finding your way to chat, Titus chapter 2, I just want to share with you from Ephesians chapter 5, as you're finding your way there, this is where we have kind of taken this idea of doing your verse, and Paul challenges the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 5, verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husband, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. This morning, as we continue in this thought process of doing our verse Ladies, I want to talk to you this morning, and I want to talk to the children. If there's, I don't even see any children in here. There's a couple. Of, here we go. We're going to talk straight to them, all right? You guys are in trouble. You're the only ones in here, so no, I'm just teasing. But parents, we can take in what the Scripture says about our kids and help apply it to their lives. So this morning, I want us to begin with the first point, and that's this, the Christian woman. The Christian woman. What does the Bible say about the Christian woman? In Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, Paul's writing and giving instructions, and he says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husband, that the Word of God may not be reviled. Let's pray together. Father, as we hear from You through Your Word, I pray that You would open our ears, that You would till the soil of our hearts so that You can implant the seed of Your Word so it would begin to grow in each of our lives. And Father, we expect great things to happen this morning, not because of anyone that's in this room, but only because you're in this place. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Older women, I'm not going to even touch that. That's what Paul says. Older women, and he's referring to those who are 60 plus or the grandmother stage in life, teaching daughters and granddaughters. Moms, grandmothers, your job is never finished. Can I get an amen? You, you never get a break. And some of you are thinking, I never had a break, so why should I expect one, right? But Paul is saying, older women, and he's referring to those, those of grandmother stages, teach the daughters and the granddaughters. He says, teach them to be reverent in their behavior. What is a fitting Christian walk? He's saying, pour this into them. Teach them what it means uh, to be led in holiness, he also says, don't be slanderers or malicious gossips or false accusers or have unedifying speech. Did you know that a lot of us have to be taught how to harness our tongue? And I'm not talking about just women, men, because men can be some of the biggest gossips in the world. Preachers can be big gossips in the world. We got to be careful. But this is, Paul's giving this instruction to the ladies to be a good Christian woman, not to be a malicious gossip, not to be a false accuser, have unedifying speech. When I read that passage of Scripture, I automatically think of my Granny Dykes. My granny was the sweetest, most precious lady in the world. And I never, ever heard her say anything derogatory about anybody. And the most derogatory she would ever get is if somebody was ripping somebody down, she would just simply smile and say, bless their heart. And that was a rip sometimes. But she was the epitome of what Paul is saying. Don't gossip. Don't false accuse. Don't have unedifying speech. He goes on, he says, don't be a slave to much wine. Don't be enslaved. Don't let my, uh, wine be a mind-altering thing or addicted to in your life. And then he says, be a teacher of good things. Be a teacher of good things. The younger women, teach them what is noble, what is lofty, what is excellent. How to be a good wife and a good mother. How to be righteous and godly. And here's the thing, ladies, just like with the men, your daughters are going to watch you and they're going to watch what you model for them. 
And they're going to imitate you in a lot of ways. So make sure that you're raising them up. But Paul refers to the older women, then he refers to the younger women, and that is single through childbearing years. So he's saying, you older ladies who have already had your families or are still involved in your families, make sure that you teach these younger ones who may not have started a family yet, but will be getting to that stage in life, to love their husbands and children, to have that affection, to have that willing love, that devotion to their families. Teach them what it looks like. Teach them to be self-controlled. Younger women, you need to be discreet. You need to be moderate in your opinions and your passions is what Paul's talking about. Be sensible. Use common sense. Use good judgment. But he also says, older ladies, teach them to be pure. Younger ladies, you need to understand what it means to be chaste, to be moral, to be modest. When I was a youth pastor, and oh boy, the young girls, we'd go on trips and we would lay out the, the, uh, what you can wear and what you can't wear. And, you know, you have to have a one-piece bathing suit or a shirt over it and all this. And the motto for the young ladies, and we had some great youth workers that were younger women that were just starting their families, but they knew what it meant to be pure, to be modest. And the motto for those young women or those teenage girls was modest is hottest. Modest is hottest, meaning don't, don't just go around and, and dress in any way that you want to. But he, they all, he also goes on, and he says, be a homemaker and be kind, making a house a home. And sometimes that doesn't come natural, so the older women pour into these younger women. Be gentle, be considerate, be sympathetic. Be submissive to your husband. That is a missed opportunity in a lot of cases because a lot of a lot of people will look at this and say well that's archaic language you know i'm not going to be submissive to anybody i'm my own person but what he's saying here this is not in a in a cowering way or the husband to be a tyrant but it's just to be submissive to as he follows christ you follow him to be under the under the subjection of meaning let him take care of you so which category are you in this morning? I'm not even going to touch that who's older or who's younger. But you know who you are. And Paul gives these instructions on being a solid Christian lady. He says, older women teach younger women. If you consider yourself to be in the older group, set the example. And that's in church. That's not just in your family. The older ladies can teach these younger ladies. If you're in the younger group, follow the example set and pass it on to your daughters. So it's just a continual effect. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Wives, you can be, if your husband is not following Christ like he should, you have a life that can be lived out in front of him to help draw him to Christ. When you're in that situation, pray and obey. Just pray and obey. If you have assumed the role of the head of your house, give it back. He's responsible for leading the home well, and you're responsible for setting an example for him if he's not following Christ. So that we see the Christian woman. Now, what about the Christian mother? Turn, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 31. I can't think of a, more, of a more fitting way. Or excuse me, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We don't need to go to the Christian mother yet. We need, we need to go to, our, we need to, go to the, uh, my notes are all messed up. Y'all have to excuse me for just a second so I can find out where I'm supposed to be. I have no idea where I'm supposed to be. So y'all just, y'all just hold on. We're going to go somewhere. And I'm not quite sure where that is, but we're going to go somewhere. So when we think about the Christian wife, that's where we need to be. Not the, we'll get to the Christian mother in a minute. But the Christian wife, when we think about the Christian wife, we need to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, we see God lay out some plans for the Christian wife. 
When we read the account of creation, when we see the account of creation unfold before our eyes, God created everything. And I love how he ended that. He said, he created this and it was good. And he created that and it was good. But when he got to man, he created, he created a human being and he said, it is very good. But there was something missing in the man's life. So God goes on, and in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. This is a beautiful story. Adam had everything before him, but there was not a helper fit for him. And God said, man needs help. Say amen, ladies. A man needs help. And God understood this. So woman was created to be a helper. In the Hebrew, that word describes God. If you go to, if you go to Psalm 33, verse 20, it says, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Psalm 70, verse 5, it says, But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. And in Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, it says, I lift up my eyes to the hill. From where, my, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That same word, when God created woman for man, help, helper, is the same word that's used in the Psalms for God. God gives us the help that we need when we need it. And so God understood that man needs help. Helper means to aid or to empower. So men, what does that say about us? God created woman to, to be our helper, to aid us, to empower us. So when we read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. In the, in the original text, there was no verb in there. And so we go back and we study the original text, and what it would do is it would refer back to verse 21 in Ephesians 5, and it would read like this, submitting one to another out of reverence for Christ, wives also to your husbands. So we're to be submissive to each other. <clears throat> Wives are to be submissive to the husband. And this term does not point to the woman's inferiority, but it points to man's inadequacy. God understood that we needed to be a team, and we had to have each other in order to be the kind of family that he created us to be. And so God created woman for man. God knows that men can't do what we need to do without you doing what you need to do, ladies. And so he created that help that we need. The submission of the wife is not based on the spiritual, spiritual condition of the husband. I want you to catch that. The submission of the wife is not based on the spiritual condition of the husband. If the husband is the leader that God created him to be, it's a whole lot easier for the wife to be submitted, submissive. But it doesn't let you off the hook if he's not. Because we need to understand there's no verse in the Bible that says, if he will do this, then I'll do that. There's no verse in there. He just gives it plain and simple. In fact, Scripture tells us why. And this is where the verse in 1 Peter chapter 3 comes in. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, even, or so that even if someday they, they would obey the word, that they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful conduct. Wives, if you do what God has asked you to do in his word, it could be the catalyst that draws that man to Christ. So you need to obey, you need to pray. The third thing about the Christian lady is this, is the Christian mother. Now we go to Proverbs chapter 31. 
You can't find a more fitting place in Scripture to see the description of a Christian mother than in Proverbs chapter 31. This is a beautiful, a beautiful portrait that is painted by Solomon. In Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 10, he writes this, An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands uh, to the distaff, and her, hand, her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her, her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes, sashes for merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and her laugh, her, and she laughs at the times to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and all the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellent, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her work, let her works praise her in the gates. Men and children, we better know what we have in our moms and our wives. We need to understand who God gave us. The tireless work, it never stops. She never stops. The, I love that phrase, the lamp, her lamp never goes out at night. Moms work tirelessly. She gives wise counsel. She gives up sleep for the family. Everything she does is for her family. We need to be praising her. We need to be blessing her. Her children call her blessed. So we've seen the Christian lady. We've seen the Christian wife. And we talked about the Christian mother. Now let's move on to the children. Children, you need to do your verse. Oh, I'm supposed to be talking to y'all, aren't I? The children need to do their verse. And some of the things that we're going to cover will apply to all of us at any age, but a lot of it has to do with while we're bringing up our children and they're still under the care of the parents. Parents, did you know that your kids need your help? Kids need your help to be guided into adulthood. The brain of a child is not ready to reason on their own. And that is a physiological fact. Did you know that until the age of 19 to 21, a child's brain does not literally, they're not, not even connected. There's a gap in there. And because of that gap, it causes them, it, they have the inability that, to reason fear. They have no fear. Do you remember when you were a kid, you would try almost anything? And some of you still, your brain hadn't attached yet because you still try almost anything. But there's no fear. There's, a, a, there's an inability to see that the world doesn't revolve around them. Can I get an amen, parent? They think everything happens. They have issues with peer pressure because they can't reason these things. And I love what Bill Cosby said one time years ago. He said, it's because they're brain damaged. Can I get another amen? amen? And because of that, they need our help. They need to understand. We need to make sure that our kids are never put in a position to make a decision on their own until they're old enough to reason out that decision. So we need to make those decisions for them. Children are not born with the knowledge or discipline to obey their parents. Let me say that one more time. Children are not born 
with the knowledge or the discipline to obey their parents. They don't understand that. We have to teach that to them. And this is why in Psalm chapter 51, verse 5, the psalmist writes, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Children, as beautiful as they are, and by the way, Charlie spent the night with us last night. A little grandparent, throw. I got to throw that in every once in a while. But even as beautiful as they are when they're children, and our kids, they're beautiful, and we, we love to look at them, we love to hold them, we love to rock them, but they are nothing but little sinners. I didn't hear an amen on that one. But they are. They're born in sin. They're born in iniquity. Kids, babies are born liars. They're born deceitful. They're born belligerent. They're born defying. Because they have the same sin nature that we have when we come into this world. I love the story of a little boy who would not sit down. His mom was after him and after him. I told you to sit down. She said, if you don't sit down, I'm going to get the fly swatter. And he knew what that meant. And so with a scowl on his face, he said, I'm going to sit down, but I'm standing up on the inside. That's belligerent. And that's how we're born. That's how we come into this world. Watch them when you teach them not to do something. And as they're they're drawn to whatever you tell them, no, they're reaching their hand and closing their eyes because they know they're going to get it popped. And they're saying, no, 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 as they're doing what they're told not to do. It's our job to help them. It's our job to teach them. And there's a process of maturity that goes on in that child's life. They have to go through it to reach the goal of obedience. And that goal is modeled by the greatest model we have in Scripture. Jesus modeled this in Luke chapter 2, verses 51 and 52. Speaking of Jesus, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. In order for our children to reach that status, they need our help. They need our guidance. We need to teach them to do their verse. So what is their verse? Turn back to Ephesians chapter 6. Children need to do their verse just like we need to do our verse in order for the family to function as God intended the family to function. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, a lot of you probably have this memorized. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Let's break down this passage for a little bit. Let's look at what this passage means. The Greek word for children does not mean a baby or a young one. It simply means an offspring. So it's talking about if you're a child of somebody, and everybody in here is a child of somebody, unless you were hatched, and there's still some question out there on a couple of you, I'm not sure. But the thing about it is, is we're all children of somebody. So here's the deal. If you've ever had a moment in your life where you were a smart mouth or you talk back to your parents, raise your hand. Don't lie. Come on. All right. That is serious business when it comes to God. It's serious business. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with you as much as it has to do with you and your status with God. Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. It's serious business to God because God makes it very clear that if a child talks back or raises his hand to a parent, you go back and study the law, it says take them out. If they raise their hand to their their parents, just take them out. It's kind of like the old saying, I brought you into this world, I can take you out of it, right? But this promise that we see 
in Ephesians. It's, 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 it's got a promise attached to it. It's the first commandment for our children with a promise. And it talks about the quantity of life, that you may live long upon the earth. It talks about the quality of life, that everything will go well with you. If, you do, if the children do their verse, it's going to give them a long, prosperous, healthy life, and it's going to go well with them. Kids, do you love your parents? Do you love your parents? Okay, they do. They love their parents. And all of our children are to love us, and they do love us. But the way that they show us they love us is by obedience and honor. And so we think of this. Parents, do you love your kids? Say amen. All right, I'm just making sure. But if we love our kids, we need to ensure that we point them in the right direction. We need to ensure that we point them in the ways of God because what God says is right is right. To obey is, is, is because it's right. To obey is not because of the consequences. The right attitude behind the right obedience is honor. When we have the, when we, when we have the right attitude in obeying our parents, that means we're honoring them. And honor is something that goes on for a lifetime. When we get married... When the time comes that we get married, I love what the Scripture says in Ephesians 5.31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's when obedience stops. When we get married and we're out from under the control of our parents and, and we're out from under the guidance of our parents and we marry, that's when the obedience stops. But once that stops, the, the obedience may be over, but the honor never quits. We're to honor our parents as long as they live, as long as we live, and that is to hold in high regard and respect. When we hold them in that highest regard and that respect, don't try to say this, and I've heard people say it. My parents don't deserve my respect. They don't deserve my honor. I got news for you. It's not based on the person. It's based on the position. God expects us to honor them no matter if, they, if we think they deserve it or not. That's not our call. God says you honor your parents. It's the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may have a long and prosperous life. I want to share something with the girls about girls. And dads, those of you who have daughters, teach them to watch how their future spouse treats his mother because that's how he's going to treat them. If he loves his mom, if he honors his mom, then she's going to have a good man. But if he talks bad about his mom, if he dishonors his mom, she's going to be in for a long life. It's a proven fact. It's important to God. Cause and effect verse. If you obey and honor your parents then you'll have a better quantity and quality of life. If not, do the math. If not, do the math. So when we think about doing our verse, men, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Women, submit to your husbands. Love them. Help them. Children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. When we do our verse, we have a strong family dynamic. When we do our verse, we honor God in our families. So as we close this morning, just a couple of questions. Ladies, are you fulfilling your verse? Are you fulfilling your verse? Are you submissive? Do you help? Are you that Proverbs 31 woman? Men, are you living a life that helps them fulfill their role? Children, are you honoring and obeying your parents in the Lord for this is right? When we do our verse, we have strong families. When we have strong families, we have a strong church. Bow with me as we close this morning.